Folks, if you, I teach multiple courses at Baldwin Wallace and have around 25 advisees who come to know me quite well. And if you ask my students, well, hey, Param's offering a new course. So Daryl, what do you think Param's going to be like as an instructor? Daryl, sitting out there, hi Daryl, will probably say, oh, Param, take him. He's nice, he's smart, and he's goofy. Folks, how many of you who haven't known me, who've known, had no history with me, like Roy sitting there, would agree that you see a, a semblance of niceness, smartness, and goofiness in me? Raise your hand. Folks, I have you fooled. <laughs> I'm neither, none of those three things. I'm not a very nice person. People who have worked with me in the past, some people will tell you he's an asshole. In fact, one of my best friends ran into the former um, professor of mine from Case, and he asked her, where is Param these days? And she said, oh, he's at Baldwin Wallace still. He said, I make it a point never to drive on 71. I stay away from toxic people. Me? Toxic? Right? So my niceness is a mask. I'm a con man. I want you to think I'm nice, but I'm an asshole. Second, smart. Pretty soon I'll give you my whole resume before the seminar is over. You will have so much information about me, things like Param has the equivalent of four master's degrees and a PhD. So you'll say this guy is smart, but actually no. That's an again mask I wear. I want you all to think that I'm smart because I suffer from deep intellectual insecurities. So I put on a mask and I try to fool you. And then am I goofy? I'm not even goofy. How many of you see me as a lighthearted, goofy person? Not if you see the iPod selections on my phone, music selections. Every music is, is like a cloud of sadness. At random, I will pull up, oh, my friends, my friends, don't ask me what my sacrifice was for. Empty chairs and empty tables, all my friends, they're dead and gone. You never thought you'd hear lemmas in an Indian accent. <laughs> you will hear the Rolling Stones in an Indian accent if you come back for the second half of the seminar. Pink Floyd in an Indian accent, all of those artists. So I am not very sad, I'm full of sadness, but I cover it up with the masks. So first, let's square up with each other. How many of you would agree that you all wear masks? Raise your hand if you agree that you wear masks. I don't know about you, I'm often at funerals where I'm not feeling the slightest sadness. But I have to wear a sad expression on my face. How many of you have been in this unenviable predicament of faking it at a funeral? Okay, worse still, I perform marriages in the state of Ohio. Why? Because there were several instances of people who attended, attended my seminar beyond the ecstasy of love and agony of marriage. They loved all the shit I told them there. That they said, we want you to perform our marriage for us. And I said, you want somebody who's divorced three times to marry you? Don't you think that's going to start you off on a bad footing? They say, no, no, we wanted the accumulated wisdom that you have uh, after three divorces. I said, okay, I don't think I have much wisdom to show, but certainly I'll perform a marriage because I'm a publicity hound. I love attention. You think I do these seminars to serve you? I don't give a rat's ass about your well-being. I just coast on the attention. I surf on the attention, and that's why I do this. Uh, you know, I'm drunk with a sense of my own importance. And I love the sound of my voice. <laughs> and I get to hear it for five hours straight. Four and a half, yeah. if you insist. <laughs> no, the audience leaves at four and a half, but I keep talking till five. <laughs> so, and uh, so these unsoft years. So I perform weddings in Ohio, okay? And soon the number of weddings that I have performed is catching up with the number of marriages I have experienced myself. You know, they're close. <laughs> We try to keep one step ahead. So I'm at many weddings, and let's say you decide, you're already married, right? But let's assume I was the officiant and you asked me to perform your wedding to this wonderful, handsome man. I'll show up, I'll say, congratulations on your marriage. I'm so happy that you're getting married. I wish you decades of infinite bliss. But you know what my chattering monkey is doing while I'm faking it? He has burst into Fred Freddie Mercury's rendition of another one bites the dust. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Right? So we wear masks. So folks, when after you pee and you're back here, in fact, my brother once suggested that you should bill your seminar as one in which you will also give people the ability to instantly access happiness. I said, how would I do that? He said, don't declare any break. 
At the end of the five and a half hours when they go pee, they will have had an explosion in happiness. <laughs> Thank you, Srira. Wonderful chair. <laughs> uh, the next segment of our presentation is known by different names. In the Zen tradition, they call it discovering your original face. Osho talks about it as unsobbed tears or getting your masks off. And we just spent a few minutes just before we broke, uh, had the break, talking about how all of us are wearing different masks. And I propose to you that I'm wearing three masks of being very nice, of being very smart, and of being goofy. And I'm perhaps none of these three things. Then the question arises, who is the real Param if he's not just nice, smart, and goofy? So I'm going to take you through a methodology or an approach which I will describe. And I will describe three defining moments in my life which filled me with a tremendous explosion of shame and inadequacy. I don't think you give a rat's ass about all the crap that happened to me in my life, but I want you to use that as an invitation and as an opportunity to work through your life and some of the parallel experiences that you might have had in your own life. So the idea behind unsobbed tears is very simple. Osho talks about how there are many things that happen to us that fill us with a tremendous sense of sadness. And we grieve those experiences fully. Now, if you've grieved the sadness fully, the chances are that the sadness may still be within you as a residue, but it's a sweet sadness. How many of you can relate to a kind of romantic, poetic, sweet sadness that's actually a pleasant sensation? You know, nostalgic and so on and so forth. But there are another class of experiences, says Osho, where you don't allow yourself the freedom to grieve fully. Something happens that fills you with a tremendous implosion of sadness. But rather than allowing yourself to grieve fully, you walk away from it because it's unpleasant to deal with sadness. These are the experiences that we call unsobbed tears. The tears that you never sobbed that persist within you. And they exact a heavy toll on our, uh, on, on our functioning. What we are going to be doing in this session is exposing you to a particular methodology that I think came originally from the Zen tradition of having you peel away layers of masks that you might have built up to engage you with the question, who am I below these masks? Now, this segment of the presentation is going to go in some weird ways in the sense that it will make unexpected twists and turns and where we end up with at the end may have no relationship to where you thought we were going. You know, in the true uh, Zen tradition, we will be um, navigating a terrain that's very um, complex, sometimes paradoxical and counterintuitive. So here goes. One of the experiences that potentially happened to you when you were a child of unsolved tears was an experience that probably filled you with a tremendous sense of shame and disappointment. For me, I was five years old riding on the back street of a car in New Delhi, and I was incessantly blabbering, a stream of thoughts and observations on the traffic in the street. And I kept talking. You know, nothing much has changed, as you can tell. I was talking continuously when I was five, and I keep talking continuously when I'm 55. I kept talking. All of a sudden, somebody in the car turned to everybody else and said, I worry this child suffers from a men mental disability. He doesn't ever seem to say anything intelligent or smart. It was in that moment that my world collapsed. It was almost like the mirror had been dropped and splintered into a thousand fragments. It's the mirror of my being. Because I grew up in a family where if you got elected as the president of the country or the prime minister, they'd consider you a loser. But if you were able to teach kindergarten, they would consider you the march of God on earth. So doing well at school, there was a premium on it. And the idea that I would not be able to get through high school because of a mental disability was extremely mortifying. Now, when something like that happens, what does the child do? Children are very fragile. And one of the things that happens in our life is that the fragility of the child which can be best captured by the wings of a butterfly. You know how delicate the wings of a butterfly are? If you touch it, it might even disseminate, dis, you know, dissipate right in your hand. The wings of the butterfly, they come into a violent clash with the world of the grown-up. The grown-up is a very brutal entity compared to the child. I mean, the grown-up is represented by somebody who's wearing boots who will step on the butterfly's wings and tell the butterfly, I did this for your own good. You know, so the clash between the world of the child and the world of the grown-up is a very tragic one, one that has devastating consequences for children. In fact, how many of you 
could go back to the time when you were very sensitive because children have a tremendously delicate, sensitive attunement to emotions, to feeling the emotions and, you know, all of that. And what happens is the adults relate to them in fairly brutal ways. And it's at those times that the doors of the child's heart start closing in because the child has to protect himself. The vulnerability is too scary, is too damaging. So what happens is we shut down emotionally. When we shut down emotionally, we grow up. We start existing not in the peaks and valleys of human emotions and their beautiful vicissitudes, but we start living in the plains in a bandwidth of controlled emotional regulation. We are not too excited about anything, neither are we too devastated by anything. You maintain an even kind of a mood and society respects you for that. She says, oh, he's a very, uh, you know, a, a person of great equanimity, neither too excitable nor too. But the tragedy, as Osho says, is if you don't allow yourself the permission to feel the depths of your sadness, you have also lost with that the ability to feel the ecstasy, the ecstatic peaks of your happiness. If you cut yourself off from sadness, you will also cut yourself off from happiness. If you have to experience the peaks of happiness, you also have to be open to all the sadness that can come with it. But we end up closing down. Now what I'm going to be doing through the next one and a half hours is taking you through a process, hopefully helping you to start unblocking your relational and emotional arteries of starting to feel tender and soft emotions more powerfully and helping you look at what kinds of things might have happened to you in your life that might have caused you to kind of shut the doors of your heart and block yourself off. So I want to start with this experience where people thought I was mentally disabled. And in that situation, the child decides, I should be lovable, but just now I have been called mentally disabled. So I can't be lovable in this state. How do I make myself more lovable again? Think about it from the perspective of a child. The child's question is, how do I make myself more lovable? That's the one existential conundrum or dilemma that he has to wrestle with. So you, I ask myself, how do I make myself lovable? Now, in response to that pain, I start developing a safety armor around me, or I start putting on a mask. My mask was to become an extremely sweet and nice child, because I realized that if I became a very nice and sweet child, I became very lovable. Nobody says shit like, oh, you're mentally retarded to a very sweet and nice and compliant and obedient child. So it was a kind of a bargain that I struck with the adult world. I will be so sweet and polite and you will also treat me very nicely. This continued. In fact, I worked my politeness and sweetness to the level of an art form. I became a tourist attraction in India. People would visit the Taj Mahal and then they'd say, let's go and see Param. There's this kid who they say is such a sweet kid. I became sickeningly sweet and of course everybody applauded. But my sweetness was a fake sweetness. Why would I even say that? Do you recognize that when you're five, the constructs of meanness and niceness don't really translate very well into your own world? Just like when you're three, if you take my wallet, I can't say you took my, you stole my wallet. Because the concept of theft, the property doesn't exist in the three-year-old. In the same way, the child doesn't know anything about what's mean and what is sweet and what's nice but he or she is in a predicament. The predicament is he doesn't know who he or she is. He has to construct his identity through the eyes of the grown-up. Osho says the world of the child is akin to living in a world where there are no reflecting surfaces. Imagine if there were no lakes and rivers and no water, no glass, no mirrors. How the hell would you know what you look like? Only through the eyes of others. And that's how our identities are constructed, through the eyes of others. So then I started censoring and modifying my behavior so as to always elicit affirmation from the grown-ups. Oh, what a sweet child Param is. How sweet, incredibly sweet he is. And I went about that and perfected it to the level of an art. The consequence of that is that anything that resembled meanness in me, I would suppress. And I would keep suppressing it deep into the basement of my being. And in that basement, my meanness started growing stealthily like a marijuana plant. And what happened was anything that you suppress only gathers more in power and intensity. So fast forward, it was not until I was 48 years old that I discovered 
that I had become somebody who's emotionally abusive to the people nearest to him. In fact, one of the, it's just some time back, I was driving my son back to Syracuse where he goes to school, and he was looking at me and shaking his head and saying, Dad, you used to be such an asshole. And all of a sudden you changed. And that was true, because I lie, lived this duality. All my colleagues at Baldwin Wallace and students would think of me as such a nice guy. He's so nice, he's so helpful. But the people nearest to me, they had a different vantage point from where they could see. Somebody who used to lose it all the time, who used to be emotionally abusive, who used to have temper tantrums that would come off at weird times. Like for example, one of the craziest experiences that I've had, and I'm gonna squirm as I tell you this about myself. How many of you know there used to be a chain of stores called Blockbuster? <laughs> Once I rented Charlie and the Chocolate Factory from Blockbuster to watch with my son. That DVD didn't work, so I took it back and threw a tantrum in the store. That's one thing if my six-year-old son threw the tantrum. No, his 48-year-old father lost it. Because the manager at the Blockbuster said, I don't have another copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I could give you instead SpongeBob SquarePants. I said, there's no way I'm gonna accept SpongeBob SquarePants. I had rented Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and you are going to make available to me Charlie and the Chocolate Factory today. And the gentleman said, sir, if you continue to create a scene, I'll have to call the Shaker Heights police. With my tail between my legs, I quietly left the store, right? I used to be a nutcase. How many of you would say that a guy who loses his shirt over Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is in need of serious therapy? <laughs> yes, I was that person, right? And then, all of a sudden, today, through the methods that I'm going to describe, I have evolved to a level where you can take a shit on my head and I won't get mad at you. I mean, don't just try it before the cameras are turned off. <laughs> okay, so I've come to a place of complete equanimity and serenity and nothing ever pisses me off. And even if it does, it's just a fleeting thing and then I'm laughing about it. So how did I bring about this transformation? I'm gonna share with you a very powerful method, one that I think you're unlikely to encounter in most Western traditions of therapy or emotional intelligence. So that was my first experience acting sweet, and then I became emotionally abusive uh, to, um, you know, to my nearest circle of friends and family. It was not until 2008 when I encountered the writings of the Eastern mystic Osho that I began to see, wow, I'm leading this false life. 